Awesome. Well, I'm uh, I'm uh, so thankful that we have all of you here today. Uh, so without any further ado, we're just going to get right into it. So we'll go around and we'll get everyone's top third pick, then their top second and the second wave, and we'll do a final wave uh, for your very top pick. And then if there's time, we can do a, a couple uh, honorable or maybe even dishonorable mentions uh, at the end. So let's start with Pontus. What's your third favorite release from 1980? I go with this one. I, I don't know if you can see it, but I hope you can do that. It is um, Michael Schenke Group, self-titled. It's Michael Schenke's first album, um, recorded in 79, I think. It has, Roger Glover produced it. It was his first album after the UFO. And it has um, Simon Phillips on drums. It has Mo Foster on, on bass. It has... Don Airy on keyboards, Gary Barden on vocals, and Michael on, Michael Schenker on guitar. This is a very, this is the first Michael Schenker group album. Uh, later, he formed a touring band with Cozy Powell and Chris Glenn and all that, but um, and Paul Raymond, of course. And um, this album is spectacular. It's Armed and Ready, Cry for the Nations. Victims of Illusion. Uh, there's an instrumental, hair, instrumental, um, and uh, there's uh, Into the Arena is on here. Um, my favorite pick on this album is this track that ends the album called uh, Lost Horizons, which is a, a quite epic, sort of mysterious and uh, heavy song, which became a masterpiece live. And I highly recommend this album. Highly recommend it. Uh, if you if you're into the UFO, this is this is no a no brainer. Go and get it. It's just um, enormously good. Uh, great hard rock uh, from the 1980. Awesome. All right. Cool. Uh, so let's keep it rolling here. Melissa, we can go with uh, your uh, number three top pick of sure. 1980. Um, okay. I do not have a prop, um, but I am going with uh, the Scorpions. Um, th when this album came out, this is the first album with Matthias doing all the guitar work. And the thing that I love about this album, well, first of all, um, it, Oh, it's called Animal Magnetism. I, I forgot to mention that. <laughs> Sorry, Animal Magnetism. And um, it has that interesting cover that everybody's kind of not sure what's going on on the cover of that, of that kind of a controversial cover. But um, the thing that I loved about this album is I am probably more of a 70s Scorpion fan. And this is sort of that bridge before they go to where they would go with uh, Love at First Sting and Worldwide Live and all of that, which I also love, but I really love the 70s stuff. And I kind of think this is them kind of moving in their 80s direction, sort of the bridge album for me. It has the zoo on it, which is my favorite 80s song by them. And um, it opens Do Me and it's just a really great album. Awesome, awesome. Uh, interesting, the last panel I just did was about the Scorpions and I sort of, Missed the boat on the scorpions and anim uh, animal magnetism was recommended to me uh, to listen to as a as a as a good starting point. I have a pet sitting business and it's actually I actually named it animal magnetism because I thought it was a cool name. Oh, hey, there we go, there we go. Plug for animal magnetism. There Check it go. out, everyone. If you need pet sitting services. Um, all right, well let's let's keep it rolling here because uh, we're going to have lots of time for uh, a fun sort of freeform chat too at the end here if we go at this pace. So Jamie, why don't you keep us rolling and give us your third favorite release of 1980. Sure. Um, this is a good year in music for me, so it's kind of hard to get it down to three. So I'm going to be talking about maybe some weirder stuff that people don't usually talk about, um, except for the, first, the top one that was never going to be in doubt. So I'm going to be talking about Kansas Audio Visions. Ooh. Kansas has recently become just a my basically my favorite bands um uh this is i mean this is not like my favorite kansas album but it's also it's got a lot of stuff on it i really like it actually has my favorite kansas song on it 
Um, the cover is kind of terrible, but uh, <laughs> that's sort of besides the point. I love the back cover. That's why I have it hanging up right there. This great guy looking crazy. Just, I don't know what it is about it. I just really dig it. Um, but yeah, it's got some fast stuff on it, like Loner and Relentless are sort of more hard rock stuff. It's not as like proggy as the earlier Kansas stuff is. Um, you got like the hits, I think, were Hold On and No One Together. I uh, really like No Room for a Stranger. That's more of a like a like a barroom boogie thing. But the song I love off the my favorite Kansas song is a song called Don't Open Your Eyes. It's one of the weirdest songs I've ever heard. It's really creepy. <laughs> um, the lyrics basically all like, don't open your eyes because it might be me. And it kind of goes on like that. And then at the end, it's don't open your eyes because it might not be me. So I'm not even sure what it's about. Um, but the, the drumming on it is insanely fast. The instrumentation is very odd and creepy. It's got like violin stings. And it's not like anything else I've ever done, um, but it, I really love it. Um, so yeah, that's Kansas Audiovisions. Awesome. Well, it sounds, uh, sounds good. I, I've never heard it, but I'll, I'll have to check that out. Yeah, I love the song Curtain of Iron. That's a really good that too. Album. Yeah. Great riff at the end. Yeah. Oh, awesome. All right. Well, we've already got some connections forming uh, for me here uh, on the panel, so that's great. Uh, David, why don't you keep it going and uh, give us your third favorite release of 1980. All right. Um, Nick, I apologize. I... Um... I picked one album. I didn't get three. I was a little on, uh, um, I didn't know how many I should pick. And I, uh, contrary to what Jamie just said, this was actually a tough year for me to pick albums. I, I felt like there's not a lot that I liked from this year. And the, some of the stuff that I did, um, I, I know other people are going to pick. And for the sake of redundancy, I'd figure I'd pick one album and then just sacrifice some of that time uh, for maybe question time afterwards. All right. um, but did, the, did you want to give your top pick at the same time everyone else does then? Or do you want to just do it now and uh, uh, we can move on afterwards? I can do it now. Sure. Let's go for it. Yeah. All right. So um, my top pick is um, probably my second favorite. It's in the top three of, of this band that I like quite a bit. And it's um, an odd pick for some because it's a lineup that they only had one time um but my pick is yes drama that's my prop because i don't have the album with me i um love drama he um starts off with machine messiah which is you know when you hear it, it's for for yes which sometimes isn't as aggressive it sounds like you're listening to king crimson red or something and you got you you basically have um Yes, doing and fitting in with what Rush was about to start doing or started doing with the keyboards. Jeff Downs' keyboard work on this album, I think, is is might be my favorite key work, uh, keyboards on any Yes album, period. Uh, I think that the second half of it with Into the Lens Run uh, Through the Light and Tempest Fugit is a flawless side. Uh, the first side I like quite a bit. The only one that I don't care for as much is, is uh, A Man in a White Car which is only less than two minutes. And it honestly sounds like the type of music that plays right before, like I don't, back in like the nineties or something to be like breaking news, like little, you know, segment that come in and this the little like incidental music that'd be in the background. So it's a, it's a little strange, but it's only like a minute and a half. So who cares um, for anybody that's watching that might not know this and, and likes this album uh, because this band was absorbed by the Buggles. Uh, when Yes left the vacuum of John Anderson vocals and Rick Wakeman keyboards, the Buggles joined and they left afterwards, but their follow-up album does have a completely alternate version of Into the Lens called I Am a Camera. It was like a single. It's very different and I love both versions. I don't know which one I, I love more. This is the album that it gets overlooked at times. This is the album I wanted Asia to be. When Asia was the big super group, and of course, like half this band, you know, bifurcated into Asia or uh, the Yes, uh, Yes West with 9021, what was it, 90215, 90125, sorry. 
Um, when that came out in 83, it was basically this band split up. And this is this has the prog, this has the you know the catchy stuff. It it walks a fine line, and it's really what I wanted that Asia album to be. And save for one song and and the um, I think the album cover, the Roger Dean album cover is kind of cool. I'm not a huge fan of it, but this album is my pick. And uh, yeah. Awesome. All right. Well, uh, come, coming out swinging there with the, the topic right off the bat. Uh, I like it. Uh, okay. So, uh, well, we've, we've got our uh, top three picks for everyone. Uh, and uh, David's given us his, uh, his, you know, three for one uh, power pick, we'll call it. Uh, so let's, let's keep it going. And uh, Pontus, why don't you give us your second favorite release of 1980? Red in Willin, White Snake. This is the, uh, I think, the third album by them. Um, it is um, released in 1980. It has uh, the big hit here was Fool for Your Loving. And it has some fantastic songs on it. It's right, bef- you know, it's the more like a bluesy purple thing here rather than what it became for 1987. I know that many Americans don't know these early albums that well, but you have like Food for Your Loving, Sweet Talker, uh, Red and Willing, um, uh, Cast Your Loud, Blind Man, which is just fantastic, Ain't Gonna Cry No More, um, Love Man, and black and blue and she's a she's a woman on here and it's just a, it's just a great rocking album it just uh just right down to it it's um it's a bit boogie it's a bit bluesy david sings very well here it has ian pace on here it's john lord Bar- uh, bernie marston mickey moody um it's the and neil murray on bass so that's the classic early um white snake lineup at its height uh at its peak and it's just a fantastic album ready and willing all right awesome uh melissa why don't we uh keep going with you and give us your okay. second favorite pick of 1980 my second favorite pick, and I do have a little prop. This is my original. I don't know if you can see it. Black Sabbath, Heaven and Hell. Now, I was already a Black Sabbath fan um, when, you know, Ozzy was with the band. And I was already a Rainbow fan when Dio was with Rainbow. So this, for me, was like the best of both worlds. I was so excited when this album came out. It's my favorite Black Sabbath album. I also, this is also the first time that I saw Black Sabbath in concert. It's also the first time I saw Ronnie James Dio in concert. It was an amazing show. Um, Interestingly enough, though, it wasn't fully Black Sabbath because, as a lot of people may or may not know, Vinnie Apice took over um, on the kit, behind the kit uh, for Bill Ward. He, I think he left like in August. It was only like a few weeks before I saw the show that um, that he left, but it was Vinny. At the time, I didn't really know, you know, I was still kind of young, you know what I mean? But I um, I was just thrilled to see Tony Iommi live and in person and to see Dio live and in person. And the set list um, was a mix of this album and um, still some of the older stuff. Um, my favorite song on this album is um, Children of the Sea, which is my favorite Sabbath song of all time. Everything on this song is amazing. Um, Heaven and Hell, of course, is is just, you know, a phenomenal song that everybody everybody loves. Every metalhead loves, loves, loves that song. And every metalhead loves this album. And it's a great cover. It's just a really um, funny cover with the um, Smoking Angels. So this is my number two pick. All right. Awesome pick. Uh, Jamie, why don't we go uh, next with you and give us your second favorite pick uh, of 1980. Yeah, so this is a weird one that nobody else will talk about, um, I'm assuming. So it's a 
is a Canadian Prague three piece, uh, but despite the t-shirt, it's not Rush. Um, it's FM, City of Fear. This is a weird one. Um, if anybody knows of FM, it's because of their first album, I would think. It's called Black Noise. It's on a lot of best Prague albums of all time lists. Um, I spent like a year trying to get into Prague really heavily. It didn't really take. Um, I did like the first FM record, but this was like the first album I bought on eBay because uh, it was like five dollars when I was looking at something else. And I was like, I'll, I'll try that and I listened to it. And I sort of fell in love with it. This is FM's fourth album. Um, they have gone. The first album is very prog. Second album is maybe the progiest thing that's ever existed. Uh, and then they pulled back from that wisely, I would say. <laughs> I, I don't have time to talk about the second album necessarily, but it was recorded all in one take, both two sides. I don't know why they decided to do that for a studio album, but there you go. So the third album is even more commercial. That one's called Surveillance. And then this one is, I don't know if I'd call it more, it's not poppier. It's probably more hard rock than their earlier stuff was. So FM, it's three guys. Uh, they don't have a guitarist. It's drums. It's viol electric violin and mandolin. Um, but the mandolin, it's an electric mandolin, but it's distorted so heavily, it almost sounds like a guitar. It's very weird. I don't know how to describe the tone that it produces really. I just really like it. Um, and then you have synth and bass on this thing. So there's, like, again, there's no guitar, but uh, they still get that, that heaviness out of it. Um, and there's a, the drumming on this thing is awesome. Uh, it's Martin Deller really goes for the toms on this thing. He's all over them, um, especially on like the, in the solos and these bridges that are all throughout this album. I really love. I would say the best song is probably the title track, City of Fear because it sort of uh, shows the progression of the band. Because when it starts off, it sounds a lot like the first album. They're like, it's a lot uh, lighter. There are bells and uh, a very, uh, like a straight violin, not an electric or distorted violin. And then it just goes into this really heavy riff where the, and the toms are all going all of a sudden. And it's just really, really cool. Um, the solo and the singing on this album is really, really good. So Cameron Hawkins is the singer. I really like his voice. It's usually very clean, but then he sometimes puts grit into it that really hits on songs like Power and Riding the Thunder and Surf and Air. Uh, those are like the heavier songs. And then there are some lighter stuff on this that would normally annoy me that it would be, it's like slow and quiet. But in this album, it really works. Um, so there's songs like Lost and Found and Silence. But I, I don't know, I guess uh, by the time those songs come up, I'm already in, they've already uh, grabbed me. Um, but unlike the first two uh, couple albums, there's nothing on here that's longer than like five and a half minutes. Um, it's a lot more, like I said, it's more of a hard rock record than is a prog record at this point. But um, and after this, they go a lot poppier. But uh, this is sort of the I don't know. It's almost like it's an album uh, perfectly designed for me. I, and I don't know if it actually will work for anybody else, but I really love it. Um, so, yeah, it's FM City of Fear. Awesome. Awesome. Well, you know, one, one of the nice things about uh, doing these panels is that if there is someone else who likes that album that was made for them, you know, they'll talk about it in the comments, right? So maybe we'll find you a, a fellow fan of, uh, of that album. All right, we have, uh, we have reached the final plateau here. So we're going to get our, uh, our top picks and then we'll have some, uh, some open-ended discussion. Uh, we already have David's yes drama. So let's see what uh, will be standing beside that album. Uh, Pontus, give us your top pick for 1980 yeah. releases. My, my, my number one is of course, heaven and hell as well. Uh, what a great album this is. What a, what a resurgence for the band. I mean, here, I mean, we've been talking on this channel about Never Say Die and about that album, and a lot of us liked it more than uh, you would expect. But uh, this is a band reborn. Um, I mean, it's very interesting to see the, the partnership of Iomi and Dio, how well they wrote together and how 
badly they got together, you know, <laughs> got on together. You know, they, they split up, they form, they split up, they form again, make another great album, and they split up, and then they form again, and then, sadly, uh, Dio dies. Uh, but every time these two, and I think it's because both of them were Italian, so they had a lot of, <laughs> I don't know if that, if that counts, but I do, I, there's a lot of um, emotions going, you know, uh, big, big, um, I, I think they had a lot of um, big arguments about what, what the music should be. When, but when they succeeded, they, they just made classics. I mean, uh, Melissa talked about the tracks on the album. I would like to add um, some deep cuts like uh, Die Young, which is just a fantastic song. Wow. Uh, great bass on that. Um, and uh, Loneliest of World, which is a heavy, a heavy riff uh, with, a lot, with a lot of um, great subtle keyboards played in the end and he and Dio just sings his heart out on that song and of course we, we talked about uh, Children of the Sea and um, and um, the title track which is just a fantastic thing because it, it's that bombast and then it goes to the fast part and it ends with this beautiful um, sort of classical piece. Um, as for many, many Sabbath albums, Tony Iommi used to do that. He used to have a separate um, sort of a, um, acoustic piece that would be, you know, like Fluff or Laguna Sunrise. He, he here, he, he incorporates it into the end of the song. It's just beautiful. And that's the work of Martin Birch, I think, that, you know, the production of Martin Birch. And I think that is, he really got the best out of this band. And uh, they made another one in, in 81, and then they split up, and then you know, we had a live album, and then Dehumanizer, and then the Heaven and Hell stuff. But I, it's just a phenomenal record, a phenomenal record, and it's, it's just a masterpiece through and through Black Sabbath, Hell and Hell. Awesome. All right. Well, we're starting to form a semblance of, uh, what's the, uh, the word here, uh, an, an agreement here. So we've, we've got an album now that it holds a number one and number two spot. So it'll be interesting to see if there's any other repeat picks here. Uh, we may have a bit of a battle for a clear cut uh, best release of 1980. Uh, Melissa, why don't you give us uh, All your right. top pick? Let's see. Anybody who knows me, if I didn't pick this, I would be heavily scolded. That's for certain. Iron Maiden. Iron Maiden. Yeah. This is the 40th anniversary picture disc. I have this album in about 600 different copies in various forms. Yeah. Uh, but I just thought I'd show you guys the picture disc because it's cool. This is still sealed. It's going to go on my wall eventually if I ever get, a, get around to it. Um, so Iron Maiden's my favorite band. Um, speaking of Martin Birch, he didn't, he wasn't, he didn't do this album, but of course he goes on after, um, his stint with, um, the guys over at, um, Black Sabbath, he goes, he gets, he goes on to, uh, do amazing things with Iron Maiden. The production on this album sometimes does get, um, people a little bit upset. Um, they, they don't love the production on this album and, and yeah, it's, it's a little bit raw. The thing about this album is, and um, Steve Harris would be very upset to hear me say this, but it has some pump punk elements in it. Um, this album, of course, has Paul Diano on it. Um, the first of the two albums that he does. It also has um, Dennis Stratton on it, which this is one and done for him. This also has um, Clive Burr, which 
he does the two more albums and sadly he has since passed away he's one of my favorite drummers i just i just love his drumming and that's probably the thing that got me into the band was um the song um running free the drums running free um, is what kind of got me into the band. So I'm a huge fan of Iron Maiden and I'm a huge fan of early Iron Maiden. As, although I love Bruce Dickinson, I really love the first two albums and I love this album. And I think that this album really um, kind of put the new wave of British heavy metal on the map for the rest of the world for the rest of us here in the US that that didn't really weren't really familiar with bands that were going to come up, which we're probably going to talk to and talk about in the honorable mentions from the new wave of British heavy metal um, that were fantastic as well. But uh, this is my pick because um, it's the beginning of my uh, very long and storied love affair with Iron Maiden. Great pick, great pick. I'm biased, but that that that'll probably be my favorite pick, uh, as as well. Uh, Paul Diano's a uh, he's a treat. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Jamie, what's uh, your top pick for release for 1980? Well, look familiar. <laughs> <laughs> it's heaven and hell. Um, so Dio is probably my just my favorite dude of all time. I basically like everything he's ever done. Um, this is my favorite Black Sabbath album. Um, I think Heaven and Hell is probably my favorite Black Sabbath song. It might be with the tape. Well, no, that's not true. Um, it's, it's my favorite Black Sabbath song. Uh, 1980 had a bunch of my favorite songs from bands. We'll talk about that later, I guess. But this album is just perfect for me from beginning to end. I can listen to it whenever, um, just all the way through. Uh, I, just, I, I just love the whole thing. And I mean, everybody's already said it. But Neon Nights is just what a fantastic way to open an album just straight kick ass just oh, it's so good um but i don't really have anything else to add besides what everybody else said other than this is my favorite so there you go all right awesome well there you have it there is the top three releases uh, according to each of our panel members we have come to somewhat of a consensus that's the word i was looking for before uh we have two number one picks for heaven and hell and one number two which makes that uh i guess overall uh the panel's top uh release but let's uh let's not be uh so you know uh stringent about it let's let's have a conversation here so david since you sat back and graciously let everyone give uh, the rest of their picks uh let's get uh, the conversation rolling with you uh what are your thoughts on on heaven and hell do you think it deserves uh all the praise it's gotten here t- tonight uh, give us your thoughts heaven and hell deserves all the praise it got here tonight i was gonna pick heaven and hell i knew that at least one person was gonna pick heaven and hell I'm not surprised everybody picked it. That's why I didn't pick it, because I just figured I'll let you guys take it. Yeah, it's 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 just in my book, it's just as good as drama. I figured that drama wouldn't be as popular as Heaven and Hell. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, that um, sometimes I'm listening to it and I think it's the best Black Sabbath album. And 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 from what I understand. Uh, while that is not a science behind saying that, it's a plausible argument with how with how unanimous the love and praise there is for that album. It's it's at least a plausible argument. People can even see, yeah, I can see where you're coming from with that. Um, but that was that was the only other album that I knew was a definite um, like masterpiece uh, from th- this particular year. There are, um, I'm a huge Rush fan. I'm a huge Judas Priest fan. Uh, Permanent Waves and British Steel, for me, uh, they while being essential, they just they just might like crack my favorite top ten list on, on the top ten list of both of those bands. So um, it's not my go to for either one of them. But you know, anybody who's watching this right now, you should still own it. It's it's you know what I mean. <laughs> Come the comments. Yeah. <laughs> but uh <clears throat> yeah i um i'm very interested in hearing that fm band that that jamie mentioned because i like prog and um i thought you were going to say progressions of power for a second i thought <laughs> you were going to pick the triumph album no uh, i haven't heard enough triumph to do that yeah i've been i've been i've been getting into them myself like uh more recently and uh i like what i hear 
Uh, also, I, I recently just heard that that um, Iron Maiden debut just within the past couple of months. And it was not what I was expecting. It was kind of cool how raw it was. Yeah. Um, it is. The production is very different. I mean, it's it's very different than what you get later on with Martin Birch. I do like the people call it the punk album, and then they have Phantom of the Opera, which is like 10 minutes long. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The punk elements, punk elements. <laughs> yeah. And it's, it's very interesting because it, um, I, what a debut. I mean, it's such a debut. It's, it, 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 it really, and it, that band becomes one of the greatest bands of all, the whole decade. Right. Uh, that really defines what, what, what what metal is they're the in, in they're the poster head. children for new wave of british heavy metal i didn't mean to interrupt you like that they're the, yeah. they're the right they're the fa- they're the face of when people think of the new wave of british heavy metal which actually the the the, the movement has a lot of different styles within that movement but when you think of the new wave of british heavy metal the first band you think of is iron maiden mm. but i think i think you know they 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 outstayed that moniker and became yes. a, a sort of poster, not just poster boy, boys for the new wave of British heavy metal, but for heavy metal at large. Mm-hmm. Great. In 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 uh, in the eighties, like mm-hmm. when 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 they release Seven Son of a Seven Son and get that huge hit. Which is a crossover hit with "Can I Play with Madness"? They have truly arrived at mainstream. Mm-hmm. I mean, <laughs> a couple of years earlier, they become you know they they are very much mangled as <laughs> devil worshippers because of the <laughs> you know because of the number of the number beasts. Of the beast, yeah. yeah, but th- then everybody you know accepts them. You know, like. And they get you know, to number one in 1990 with Holy Smoke and and still in Sweden, it's a, it's a huge band. It's a great draw, you know, everybody goes out now and, and you know, you, you have families and you have, you know, they, they, they're such a huge band, they kept their legacy. But looking back at 1980 and looking back at Maiden and Def Leppard and Saxon and all those bands. I think there's a lot of uh, positive vibes when it comes to heavy metal at the time. I mean, you have um, Blue Oyster Cult is touring with Black Sabbath um, and and having a resurgence as well. You have, as a as a Sabbath fan, you have the Aussie album, which is just fantastic with Randy Rhodes and uh, all that. Uh, And you have lots of those bands, like I said, uh, White Snake and Rainbow, and and you have new stuff coming up. So it's it's a resurgence at the very start of the decade. And that's cool. That's really, that's really interesting. Yes, (laughs) yeah, yeah. I mean, Saxon did two two albums. Two albums in one year, in the one year, yeah. And yeah. I, I have to mention, because a lot of people may not be too familiar with it, is the the debut by Angel Witch, which yeah. Martin Popoff has said, and he's not wrong, that it might actually be better than the debut of the, the, the debut from Iron Maiden, because it was a really, really, really good album. Unfortunately, after that, they kind of imploded. They didn't really... Mm. You know, where you were talking about Iron Maiden sort of taking it and running with it. And unfortunately, um, Angel, which had a really, really great, a really solid album, but they didn't do anything with it. And that's that's the problem. And that's 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 to Iron Maiden's credit that they took it. And they even when they changed lead singers and even when they changed their style and they still, you know, they kept going forward, whereas Angel, which didn't have that much that much luck. So something interesting, and I, like I, I wasn't alive in 1980, so I'm going to have to lean on the panel here uh, for uh, for you know people who lived through it, and for those who uh, you know are better at doing their research. But uh, it it seems to me that kind of a big 
maybe not a big theme, but at least a, a, a tangent running through all this is uh, a transitionary period or maybe a period of starting something that would then transition, you know, obviously Iron Maiden, their debut, so not really transitionary, but they did, like you said, do that transition. So was that just something that's, that's happening all the time because it's the start of a decade or is it something that's happening specifically because audiences are starting to get a little bit bored of the uh, sounds that they heard before and want something new, but aren't quite ready to give up everything they've been listening to before. Does anyone have any sort of thoughts on, I guess, the, the context of 1980 and the, and the context of uh, you know, surrounding the bands and, and those releases at that time? Uh, any any thoughts? Well, somebody who was there, I <laughs> I felt like, you know, you could still see like when you like I was talking about animal magnetism, you still saw the elements of the 70s. So it was it, it was a transition. I think it was a transition for a lot of bands, you know, that the 70s bands were trying to make their way. And you got bands like Judas Priest and Motorhead that were around in the 70s. And now they're seeing the new wave of British heavy metal. And most people consider them both to be new wave of British heavy metal bands, even though they predate the movement. And so you've kind of got, you know, you've got the whole thing where a lot of people were saying that they were sick of Prague was getting overblown and was getting out of control and was getting all the songs were way too long and people were getting bored with it and everything, which is kind of the same thing that you see 10 years later when you've got grunge taking over from, you know, the hair metal or the uh, power, power metal, uh, power metal, but you know, the, um, glam metal as we we used to call it glam metal we didn't call it hair metal you know what i'm saying so i think that there's always going to be some sort of a changing of the guard but you're always going to see sort of like a, a gradual a gradual thing where where you're going to see that album um continue to have elements of the last album and it's also a rebirth because you've got the rebirth of black sabbath but you've also got the rebirth of ozzy osbourne right he comes out with this amazing album with this amazing guitarist and uh, you know, reestablishes himself and relaunches his career. And you also had the that a lot of people, a lot of bands peaked at that point. You have, uh, as with Judas Priest, they had done a great albums throughout the seventies, but they peak, they reach a peak by uh, Bridges Steel. They get they get airplay. And they have few al they have at least three albums after that when when they totally dominate the scene. Right. Uh, and you have uh, like Motorhead had had Soldier Dawn, and then they get the big hit with Ace of Spades. Ace of Spades yeah. You have Van Halen that is on a constant rise and doing a great album. Uh, women and Children First, which is just uh, a, a progression of what they have done with the debut and the second album. Um, so I think, I've, you know, there was, um, you know, the, the and, and you had, for instance, Genesis and P Peter Gabriel and things like that. They tried to do stuff they hadn't done before because they wanted to branch out. And right. uh, to a certain degree, succeeded. Like yes, they 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 made a more heavy album. I mean, uh, I agree with David. It's a great album, and it has one of and um, Alan White's best uh, drumming on it. it. His best drum sound on any album. It's a just fantastic album. Um, and you have. You have a lot of the AOR bands as well. Um, Cause the year after this, we have Foreigner, we have Journey, we have Styx. So these bands were touring this year, but they, they weren't really releasing albums. But they, they had, there is this sort of uh, um, growing sort of, um, You know, the, 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 there's some good vibes around the music. And same for New Wave, you have Talking Heads doing the best album. 
you have David Bowie doing a great album. You um, you have the the lost throws of Joy Division, if you like that thing. And um, there was a lot of strange things happening. There was a lot of cool things happening. So. Um, and this Great was year. like the year before MTV, right? So this is this is yeah. the pre this is the pre dawn before MTV takes over the nineteen eighties. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, it's de it's definitely a I wasn't there, but it's definitely a period of transition. And I mean, I probably need to talk about this. Uh, so, <laughs> permanent yeah. waves is Rush moving towards what they're going to do on moving pictures, and uh, it's really hard to leave this one out of the top. It's not one of my favorite Rush albums because it it sort of shows the different the, it go, them going into my favorite period of rush with free will and spirit of radio but also has like the prog stuff has like jacob's ladder and different strings and stuff right. like that and natural science which like i said a bunch of my favorite songs from these bands came out this year natural science is my favorite rush song yeah. um but yeah it, it's so it, it you can see the transition happening through this album um exactly and like you said with priests they're going a little more commercial it's you know a uh, bunch of people deciding to do different stuff. So one one thing I'd be curious to hear all of your thoughts on, and uh, maybe we can we can start with David on on this and and work our way around. How much do you all feel that you know 1980 being a year of transition, or maybe of uh, albums that uh, didn't necessarily get replicated uh, again? How much do you think of that? Is that sort of time and you know in in uh being the start of a, a new decade and again a transitionary period and how much of it do you think is more just sort of shakeups and or different lineups that that didn't happen again you know you talked about uh yes we've got iron maiden which makes a, a few switch ups uh, after there and uh heaven and hell obviously you know dio not ozzy uh what, what are your thoughts do you think it's more a product of its uh time that we're we're seeing that or do you think it just happened to be that uh all these bands were getting shakeups and or you know in the case of iron maiden uh were in a different form than what we'd ultimately you know most of us would would find out about them um david because you mentioned uh that that lineup only really happened once how much do you think that plays uh, uh into that album sticking out for you so much <clears throat> so i understand the question um are you asking about how does it seem like it was because 1980 is the start of a new decade so we're so we're almost projecting on the substance of what's going on in pop um, in popular music on yeah. the fact that there's a there's a new letter excuse me a new number there's an eight now there instead of a 79 is that no more more so like we, we we just sort of discussed about how it in general was a period of transition right where uh the sounds that are going to become mainstream and that are going to become big are, are sort of changing but we have also touched on how each of these bands had a bit of a, a lineup shakeup or you know uh, a different lineup than they'd become famous for uh, i was just wondering if you think it's more um because all, all these albums sort of stuck out in everyone's mind right is it more because the sound is is unique um, because of the new members, or do you think it's more that the sounds are unique because they sort of came in a, at that perfect time when it's something that can be fresh and new, and that only really happens at the start of a decade and towards the end of it? Um, might be a bit of a weird question, but <clears throat> let me. I'll I'll try to I'll try to unpack I'll unpack it. So I think that um, I've done this when I'm looking at 1990. And it, it appears as though when you have the first year of a new decade, there's all this transition where it doesn't seem to reflect much of what happens two years prior or two years after it. I think that's arbitrary. I think that's us as human beings. I think if we moved all the releases that came out in 1978 and just said it was 1980, like we would see a very similar um, pattern as far as it being 1980. Um, furthermore, I think that it's common, uh, it's the conventional wisdom is that what people don't like about the 80s, that love 60s stuff and love 70s stuff and love 90s stuff is that the 80s are a very um, cookie cutter, um, almost like uh, uh, 
corporate would be an oversimplification as far as uh, what's popular, but there's, there's less chances taken and there's more of a narrow um, direction that, that um, makes a lot of the more popular albums and artists homogenized. So instead of uh, starting trends, there's a lot more following. Whether you think that's true or not is up to you know everybody's up own, own opinion. I think that um, there's something to be said about the fact that the industry was um, you know sort of for, the record label industry was forcing bands to say, look, if you don't play something like this way, you're just not going to get an album out. We're going to drop you. We got a bunch of other hungry kids that want to do stuff. And if you don't want to come out with stuff that we can actually put on um, radio, that's going to be four minute songs that we can actually push. And you want to do 10 minute songs. See you later. Like you don't tell us what to, to do anymore. We can just find a bunch of other people that the kids are going to dance to and, and we can do it our way. And the bands were sort of had to like um, look at that and say, they're not wrong. The kids wanting something different. I loved the seventies. I love Prague. I make as many topographic oceans as possible. Like I'm all for it, but I feel like I'm in the minority with that. And I understand that no matter how innovative it is to have all this interesting instrumentation and technical proficiency at a certain point, it's just about what doesn't sound new and it sounds old. You gotta do something fresh. So I concede to the 1980s, um, the mentality that we kind of have to like do something new and do something different and, and figure out how to be a little bit tighter and more concise at times. And that long stuff is kind of old hat and the hippie stuff is old hat. Um, so I think that, you know, what came first, the chicken or the egg? Is it the record labels and the industry dictating to the bands that they need to do it? Or is it the fans that are just into something different and then they, they want to uh, please uh, appease the fans? I think Neil Young said once something along the lines with people think that if you're doing something that's popular, they assume that you're not, you don't believe in it. Like you're being cynical and you're just coming up with something uh, to sell records and you don't really like it anyways. Um, it's, I'm paraphrasing Neil Young, but I remember he got criticized for a couple albums he did that, you know, went in directions his fans didn't want him to go to and, he, and, and they ended up being hit stuff. And it's like, no, I like this stuff. I actually like it too. Um, there's not, there's no shame in, in, in that as long as you, you, you know, it seems like the fans can tell um, when they're listening to an artist that actually believes in the music that they're making, if it's popular or not. Um, and that seems to be what I see from the ninth uh, uh, coming into the 1980s, this grand shuffle to, to figure out what the, what the identity of this new decade is going to be, because it's not uh, the seventies just seems like late sixties plus, um, especially by the time it starts to the mid seventies. What I mean by that is that you have certain bands that are, that have existed for like a decade and if you look at 1965, for instance, you're not looking at a bunch of bands that have been around for 10 years since the mid 50s. When you look at 1965 to 1975, you got the Who, Kinks, you know what I mean? The Stones, you got bands now that are just existing long past what would be their um, sell by date because they actually, a lot of times they're coming out with some great stuff and they just have adapted to the times. So it's like a really um, survive and adapt period. And I don't know if it's, you know, I, I don't, I think it's a combination of both. I think as far as are the fans dictating this or are the giant corporate big wigs who just want money in their pockets dictating this because they can put more songs on a radio um, a rotation if they're shorter. And uh, so, uh, so I don't know if that answers, that was long winded, <laughs> but I don't know if that kind of gives you a, 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 um, a bit of a, uh, an idea of what I think you kind of wanted to, to know or, or what seemed kinda. like. What yeah, yeah. No, no, it's, uh, I, I think you touched on the fact that you, you think it's more, um, 
the, the change is, is more something that's not necessarily natural. Uh, Pontus, sorry, I interrupted you. You want to talk about that? No, no, I, I just wanted to say that um, I also think that what happens in 77 with punk arriving and uh, the aesthetic of that changes the uh, environment for the bands, really. Because uh, by the time we reach 1980, people are accustomed to shorter songs, um, more, you know, the whole, the whole, um, as I said, hippie idea, the prog idea, the, the idea of the concept album and all that is gone now that uh, we're back with, with, um, with, uh, with albums that contains singles and contains um, short and shorter songs. And you have to adapt to that. And some people like Rush could make that happen because they, they figured, hey, we do the hit single or the singles, and then we have the longer tracks at the end of the albums for the fans. So we, we, we go both ways. And you had the whole idea with New, new Wave, which said, all right, we take the, the punk thing, but we, we add a, a more sophisticated um, layers of, um, of sounds like talking heads, taking uh, music from Africa, um, taking stream of consciousness lyrics and trying to do pop through punk aesthetics. And that is very much like what, what, what Maiden also is doing where we said that they're, they're raw, they're not Led Zeppelin. They're raw in the same, in a, in a different way. They, they, they're much more to the people's bands if you see what I mean, uh, then then being a, a huge huge band from 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 up above. Awesome. Okay. So, that, so that's, I, that's that's, a, that's another static. I think that 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 was around at the time that you had to um, make it short and sweet so that you could reach more people. So uh, I'd love to uh, hear Melissa or, or Jamie's thoughts on on this. I'm I'm sort of crystallizing in my mind a, a takeaway from this that I'll, I'll save to the end. But um, uh, Melissa, any any thoughts? Well, on I that? think you... I mean I think it's cyclical. I think that you get you get that every every couple of years. You know the the old fades away, and you got the kids find something new. You know there's a new there's a new flavor or whatever. Um, I do think that. Um, punk did change the the way people listened to music i think that pontus is right i think that they did they got kind of everything got kind of overblown with, with the prog got a little too much for a, a, for the the average person really and you know for radio play and things like that and so when punk came in it was short and sweet or maybe not that sweet but it was short <laughs> and they and then you know New Wave of British Heavy Metal kind of came out of, was kind of an answer to punk. And then with the new, new Wave of British Heavy Metal, that moved forward to, you know, to, to create New Wave, to create um, bands that would go on to be your glam metal bands. So I think that, I mean, there's always, it seems to me like it's always, there's always a cycle and there's always like a little piece of something. Somebody takes a little piece of something and then they move it, they move it forward. And then of course you've got, you know, people who jump on the jump on the bandwagon, right? You get the people that oh, uh, and that and that a lot of times is the record company that says, Yeah, we you know, this has been successful. We want more of these. Mm. And uh, and then you get so then you get that, you know. But I think that that's kind of what happens is like uh if people thought that Prague was overblown and then uh, punk came around to kind of clear that away 
and then that kind of the, people didn't like the the lack of munis- musicianship. So then you got the the eighties rock, and then you got but you still got the the punk elements in in bands like Talking Heads, like you were talking about, that is taking that punk and kind of making it more accessible and maybe um, um, making it a little bit smarter, right? A little bit more thought provoking. Um, and the musicianship has, has gone up. Um, and then, and then that's, you know, you saw the same, you see the same thing in 1990, you see the same thing in 2000, you're always going to see, you know, the old gets kind of swept away. And then there's always going to be bands that kind of can adapt, can sort of ride the wave and figure it out. Um, Rush is a great example of that. Iron Maiden is a great example of that. Um, and then when you, you look at a band like, uh, Def Leppard. So th- their album comes out in 1980. They're the new wave of British heavy metal. And then look what they do. They come to America and they move to a different, they want to be more like California sound, right? And then the more arena rock sound and all of that kind of stuff. And they want to, they want to move past that. So, you know, the other thing is, is that when you get different personnel, you're going to get different bands. Heaven and Hell is a fine example of an album that is different than what you got with Ozzy, lyrically, vocally. And we didn't even talk about ACDC, of course, mm. Back in Black came out. And that was a, that was a, that was it. So a lot of the, a lot of the bands seem to get new lease on life because they had new members, whether it be because they needed to get new members or because they chose to get new members. Yeah, that's that's interesting. And um, Jamie, do do you have any last thoughts you'd like to uh, to get in, like uh, on this sort of tangent we've gone off about 1980 as a year in, in itself? Yeah, I do think uh, you do have a couple of things just coming together. Uh, the personnel changes. I was about to me- I, was, I was going to talk about ACDC because it's sort of a giant monolith that we just sort of forgot to talk about. <laughs> this is what like the second best selling album of all time. Yeah. And I didn't even mention it. But yeah, <laughs> ACDC comes back uh, with new singer and sets the world on fire. Um, you have you know, done another Black Black Sabbath changes personnel. That that's not because of 1980. That just happened. But in pop. In popular music outside of rock, there was a void opening. Disco died and sort of the 70s soft rock sort of dying and prog is dying. And there's just these voids opening uh, by the time 1980 rolls around. Nobody knows what the 80s are going to be. So you get some some weird stuff um, this year because uh, the new genres are just beginning to form. Um, but I do think it's somewhat coincidental that that happened to be there because like... Um, Glam doesn't really, glam metal and hair metal doesn't really come until later. Um, but 1980s, just you get an eclectic mix of stuff on some of these albums, people just trying things. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, you know, for, for me, one of the best things about doing these panels is I get to, to learn from a bunch of people who know way more than I do. Uh, and it's always interesting. Uh, you know, we did a did a few back on uh, Scorpions and Guns N' Roses, and uh, I like these weird esoteric conversations because I, I feel like we get to learn something. Uh, and I think it's really interesting. It seems to, to me, from everything we all said, that 1980 is possibly the year that solidifies the record uh, label's sort of ubiquitous control where they say, uh, you need, you're the biggest band in the world. You still need to make a song that fits this mold. You can have your personality in it, but it's got to fit that, that mold of all these things that are popular because we need to make sure that this sells. And I think that maybe all these personnel changes and things like that we're seeing are some of it might be that some artists see the, you know, the writing on the wall and don't like it and take off for greener pastures. And some of it might be uh, finding, you know, the musicians that let them start to, to fit that, uh, uh, what'd you call it, David cookie, cookie cutter, um, you know, maybe yeah. not necessarily, but um, it seems like maybe that's the start of that because that nineties, that's definitely a thing, right? 2000, definitely a thing. Um, so it's interesting. We've, we've sort of, Dug, uh, dug out a little bit of an interesting kernel of, uh, of information there. Uh, I think the other thing we all agreed on as panel is Heaven and Hell. 
uh, is the Contrarian's number one release for 1980. Uh, everything else is up in the uh, up in the air. Although I also am a huge fan of Iron Maiden's debut, uh, so I'd say as a panel, we probably are all recommending that you at least, if you on the off chance you have not uh, checked out Heaven and Hell, you definitely should. Uh, I want to go around the panel one more time and let everyone give any plugs or final thoughts or any anything they want to say at all. You, you all get a, one last uh, uh, take at the mic. So uh, Pontus, uh, why don't you give your, your last message to the people for tonight? <laughs> uh, yeah, I have nothing to plug. Um, I, I just want people to... Um, Listen to to listen to uh, those those albums we we mentioned here. You might find something new, you might find something old that you've forgotten about, um, and have open ears. That's very eloquently put. Thanks for being here, Pontus. Uh, we we appreciate you having you on the panel, uh, Melissa. Why don't you tell the people what you're about? Give your your final message to them. Well, thank you very much for having me. This was a lot of fun, and I hope that um, we could do this again. Um, so I have a podcast, Middle Chat with Melissa. Check it out. Uh, definitely look at 1980. There was so many different albums. There's something for everybody. I mean, whether it's Blue Oyster Cults, we didn't even really talk about them, called the Soros Breakfast, which is a great album. Anyway, there's so much for you to choose from check it out and find some find your new favorites find, find some some bands that maybe you're not familiar with maybe maybe some stuff maybe we should have done we should have done um done like jamie and been a little bit more um maybe not pick the hit albums maybe try to find some underground stuff but there's a lot of stuff in 1980 out there check it out awesome well thanks for being here we, we look forward to having you on again uh jamie uh, why don't you give your, your final message to the people? Sure. I don't have any plugs, but I do have two things I wanted to mention that are related to a couple of the albums I talked about. 1980 is a weird year. I talk about personnel changes. I mentioned the Kansas album. Steve Walsh left after that album, and he put out an album that may have the greatest single uh, album cover of all time. This is Schemer Dreamer. It is the most ridiculous display of ego I've ever seen. <laughs> including the back uh it's a it's a fine album uh i i like it anyway it's seven songs it's more it's not really like kansas it's more rock and rolly the last song's a little proggy but the rest of it's sort of honky tonk just standard rock and roll stuff but man that is <laughs> just something else the other one is related to kansas and related to my top pick because carrie livgren the guitarist for kansas also put out a solo album uh, called Seed is, Seeds of Change, but this is a this is a Christian rock album, but it is also way more proggy than the Steve Walsh one. The thing about this is two songs on this, Mask of the Great Deceiver and To Live for the King, are sung by Ronnie James Dio. Oh. I, thought, I found that endlessly yeah. fascinating. <laughs> uh, so you have this sort of intersection of Kansas and Dio on this Christian rock prog album. So there you go. <laughs> Hey, that's a, <laughs> that's awesome. That's awesome. Uh, well, thanks. Thanks, Jamie. Uh, David, uh, why don't you give your final message to the folks at home? Oh, yeah. As a final thought um, to bookend the discussion before, I was thinking about the, the previous transition that happened before 80. If you look at it, uh, there was a big one that happened in the mid 70s where bands changed personnel. Um, just to name a few, the Doobie Brothers, Chicago, um, sort of um, uh, free turned into bad company, sort of. Uh, you got Fleetwood Mac does this shift around. You got the Eagles do this shift around. Um, and there's a couple, the, like Jefferson Airplane turns into Jefferson Starship. So there, there was um, already the seeds were planted for if we want to stick around, we got to change with the times. I think that what's I think that to drive the point again at home is that it's a really weird time how the 70s were the first time that you saw some of these bands had been around for so long and you have older uh, people in their 30s or 40s 
making music for the kids. And I think that has a lot, that also has something to do with it. Eventually you're just not, you're just not going to know what teenagers are into anymore. You got to just give the mantle back to them so they can, they can do it for themselves. But, but um, yeah, they, um, one thing I wanted to ask, Melissa, you said that you saw Black Sabbath in 80. I, I know that on, I know that on at least one of those legs, it was the black and blue tour. Did you see that one? I did not see the black and blue tour. No. Oh, um, bummer, I guess, because that seemed I know, like it no, would have been pretty it was cool. A, it was a big bummer because the thing was, is that in 1980, I was living in, I live in Boston. I was living in the Boston area and I moved to Florida. And so I missed the show because it came, it came up here when I was down. Do you know what I mean? It came to Boston when I was in Florida, but it was in Florida when I was in Boston. So I missed it. So I didn't <laughs> get to see Blue Oyster Cult till the next, I didn't get to see them till um, uh, Fire of Unknown Origin the next tour gotcha well yeah that's that's nick that's it uh, as far as me uh you know th check out those those stations i, I mentioned earlier contrans is awesome you know i i had a good time with you with all y'all so that's cool awesome awesome well uh that that's it everyone we're uh we, we we've wrapped up but i want to thank uh, each of our panelists for being here. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I, again, I said it before, but I learned so much uh, just being able to, to listen to all of you uh, give your, your top picks. And uh, I want to thank all of you at home as well for watching. We, we really appreciate it. We recently crossed 5,000 subscribers, which is uh, mind blowing for us. Uh, you know, um, just thank you so much. Uh, I know I send Marco's regrets. He, uh, he wanted to be here tonight, uh, but he was unable to make it. Uh, so thanks to Marco as well for all that you do for the, the channel. I think everyone appreciates you. Uh, if you want to be part of these conversations, you can join the Patreon uh, and get in on the panel discussions. Um, there is also a Teespring if you would like some uh, Contrarians merch. Uh, there is a Kofi if you'd like to uh, buy Martin a coffee. Uh, I know he would appreciate it. And uh, don't forget, uh, we don't mention this enough, but you know there, you should also be checking out uh, Martin Popoff's books. Uh, he's got you know a ton for sale. That's what started this this whole uh, Contrarians channel. Uh, so once again, thank you to all our panelists. Uh, once again, thank you to all of you at home. Uh, everyone have a great and safe night. Keep on uh, rocking and keep on uh, having those contrary opinions. Thanks, everyone. Have a great night. And uh, for everyone here, I'm just going to stop the recording. <laughs>